Just want to make sure that the live feed goes through. And you can see me and hear me, right, Becca? Yes. Okay. You were quiet, and I was like, oh no, did something happen? <laughs> You just make sure if you're just coming in, if you just um, mute yourselves or, you know, I'm going to mute all and then Becca just unmute yourself. That's the easiest way to do it. All right, everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us on our um, I don't even remember how many we've done of these, but our, our latest installment of Tanisha's Live. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that today we launched our website. So you can find us now on, by either going to dvtanisha's.com or going to atlanticrec.com. We're really excited about it. Um, you can read there about the latest news and updates. And I think most importantly for the people in on this call, you can read about our projects and the, the prog projects that we're working on, on uh, some salvage projects, some dive projects on the shipwrecks that we love in the North Atlantic and in other places around the world. So we hope you'll check it out and I'll put it in the chat for sure. But I don't want to take too much time because we have two amazing speakers today, two amazing women, wreck divers, photographers, um, and this is part of our celebration, not only of diving and dive photography and the beautiful shipwrecks around the world, but also this month, we're taking a moment to highlight women in wreck diving. So we have two amazing people tonight. First up is Becca Boring. Becca is uh, with Bax. She works for Backscatter, uh, underwater photography and video. She is going to talk tonight about the, the shipwrecks of Chuuk Lagoon and um, you, Becca is not only a photographer who's visited Chuk many times and photographed there, but she also leads expeditions there. So if you are interested in traveling to truck, certainly doing it with Backscatter is, is the way to go and get the professional advice that Becca can give you. And so you get beautiful photographs while you're there too. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Becca um, for the first half of our presentation to talk about um, Chuk Lagoon. Well, thanks, Jen, and thank you guys for having me here today. I super appreciate it. Um, I'm going to say pressure's on a little bit because Brandy actually lives there. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is a, a, her, very much her turf, too, um, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to do it justice. Um, Chuk is, is uh, definitely one of my favorite places on Earth, um, and, uh, and it's just kind of a a magical place uh, for for history and and Rex. Um, let's see. There we go. So I think most um, divers and history folks uh, uh, know a little bit about Chuk um, and uh, and where it is. So you can see on the map here uh, where the Federated States of Micronesia are, just down from Japan and uh, Okinawa. You fly through Guam mostly to get there, and then you can see uh, Chuk here. So uh, Japan acquired Chuk after World War I and uh, made it their major naval base of operations um, during World War II. Um, and in February of 1944, the US carried out a two day strike uh, against um, uh, Truck Lagoon there uh, called Operation Hailstone. It could have been a lot worse um, for for Japan. Um, about two weeks prior to that, uh, they had done the U.S. had done a, a high altitude flyover reconnaissance mission, um, which uh, the Japanese Navy picked up, and uh, they moved most of the fleet out um, just days after that. And so there could have been a, a whole lot more wrecks um, in that in that area, a whole lot more, um, <clears throat> you know, stuff going down there uh, had they not gotten rid of a lot of their fleet. So the folks that were left over were um, a lot of ships undergoing repairs um, or still offloading cargo. Um, we 
uh, have there's a bunch of operations there. Um, there's some great liveaboards, the Odyssey, which uh, Brandy is pretty familiar with. The, they're awesome. There's the Truckmaster. Um, we uh, do a land-based operation there when we go uh, with Blue Lagoon, and uh, it's it's a, a fun, quirky little uh, resort there on a uh, on on truck and it's we like it because you take little boats out to um the wrecks and you can see from the map there that there are just a ridiculous amount of wrecks um so during operation hailstone they they sunk uh, hundreds of, of of planes they downed hundreds of planes and and sunk dozens and dozens of of ships mostly merchant vessels um so there are just an obscene number of wrecks to dive. Um, so in, in trying to come up with a 20 minute presentation, um, wasn't quite sure how to go about that. Uh, so I thought I'd just kind of pick a few um, of the wrecks that I'm, I'm most excited to get back to for one reason or another. Um, so I, I kind of narrowed it down to, uh, to seven and I won't call them my favorites because that's really, really hard. Um, but these are the ones that I'm super excited to get back to um, as soon as, as travel opens up again. I think, think I might just have to go for a weekend or something just to, to get there. Um, and I think my, my first pick is the Fujikawa Maru. Um, this is often the first dive you'll do um, in track. It's, it's pretty shallow. It's maybe 120 to the sand, but most of it's much, much shallower. And it's just a treasure trove of stuff. Um, there's, you know, tons of airplane parts in the cargo hold. There's, you know, uh, beautiful aft steering, great. Um, uh, the machine shop is just the, the I think, possibly the coolest thing um, out of all the things in Shrek. Um, there's a, a, a lot of like really funky storage stuff and uh, big machinery compressors. The uh, infamous R2-D2 is located there, the uh, uh, compressor there that looks like our favorite Star Wars character. Um, I think I would fly to Trek every year uh, if the Fujikawa was the only wreck there. Um, and you know, again, it being really shallow, you get a you get a lot of time there, and uh, it's it's just a, a lovely, beautiful wreck. It was originally um, a passenger and cargo ship, as most of the wrecks there were. It was uh, requisitioned by the Imperial Japanese Navy in the early '40s. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think another one, uh, which is a, a newer one for me that I, I hadn't been on until the the last time um, I was there, the Amagi San is a, a, another stunningly beautiful wreck. Um, another passenger cargo vessel requisitioned by the, the Navy. It survived uh, quite a few close calls in a, in a lot of places. It was, uh, it survived a torpedo attack in 42. It was bombed in 43. It actually killed their commanding officer and, um, and another crew member. Um, and it ultimately ended up in, uh, in Chuuk for repairs and uh and that's where it was it was sunk um <clears throat> that one i i love because there's not a lot of soft coral on it it really looks like a really looks like a wreck um there's a beautiful bow gun um and uh oil tanker in the on the sand there um and uh you know king's post still intact um just a, a really really gorgeous wreck I, I did hear that the the gun may be in the sand now on the bow not use that yeah um <clears throat> so that's that's unfortunate but that is that is how time works uh with these things which is one thing i love about photography and wreck diving is you can you can capture moments that that are very fleeting um and and may not exist the next time you uh you visit so um <clears throat> Yeah, just another really, really beautiful wreck that I, I'm looking forward to spending more time on ultimately. Um, <clears throat> another super popular one is the Rio de Janeiro. Um, also another really popular first dive. Uh, it's big and beautiful, not super deep, uh, has gorgeous giant props um, and probably one of the most uh, popular sites to to go see uh, in Chuk is the uh, the beer bottles, the <laughs> empty room of, of bottles, and um, it's a that's a picture actually my dad shot of me shooting those in there. Um, 
it's a lot of fun, fun cargo holds. But man, the engine room on uh, on that wreck is is really gorgeous to a, a very stunning spot. Um, and uh, and yeah, the the props are beautiful. It's a, a giant ship um, and and just gorgeous. Definitely worth uh, some some additional dives. It's a it's a good warm up dive, but it's one that you want to go back to um, for for sure. <clears throat> Probably the most popular uh, or the most talked about wreck uh, in, in truck is the San Francisco uh, Maru. It was built in 1919 as a, a passenger and cargo ship. Um, it was uh, requisitioned by the Navy in the, in the 30s and then uh, sold back to the cargo company and then requisitioned again in the, in the 40s. Um, and it arrived uh, in Chuk, uh, in early February, and um, the whole convoy it was with departed on the 12th, and it, it stayed behind, um, uh, which was unfortunate uh, for, for them. Um, it it uh, sustained some damage in the first day of the attack, but uh, ultimately stuck it out and um, was sunk on the second day of Operation Hailstone. Um, it's often referred to as the million dollar wreck just because of the sheer amount of stuff in the, the cargo holds. One of the first dives I did on this wreck, one of the, the guys we were diving with came up and he was like, man, I'm glad to see all that stuff sitting at the bottom of the ocean that could have been used to kill a whole lot of people. And <laughs> to say that, um, that it's definitely one way to look at it. Just every cargo hold is, is full of, you've got the spherical mines, just boxes and boxes of ammo and cordite. There's tanks, which um, are, look very miniature, I think in, in real life. It's funny, you think of tanks as this big giant thing. And, and I think that's a very American concept. <laughs> um, Japanese tanks are a bit more dainty. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this ship is just chocked full of just, you know, the machinery of, of war. And uh, it's, it's quite something to, uh, to see and, and has, uh, you know, one of the most iconic bow guns, I think that you'll see photos of um, in, in Chuck, you can see there's my, my dad shooting that um, <clears throat> there, but yeah, just a, just a remarkable um, wreck full of all kinds of stuff to see. You need, you need multiple dives. Um, there's really three different dives on that wreck. You dive the, the bow and check out the tanks and the, the bow gun and then the, you know, the cargo holds and the stern. I mean, it's just a whole different dive. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's definitely worth taking a scooter or going multiple times because there's a lot to see on that wreck. And, um, Another one of my favorites uh, is the Nippo Maru. Um, it was built in the 30s, uh, and um, you know, like the others, um, requisitioned by the by the Navy, um, and turned into a sub tender, I believe. Um, it sunk on the second day of the attack. There were no casualties um, on board. It's, uh, it's about 150 feet to the sand and has one of the most uh, picturesque bridges, um, which I of course didn't include a picture of, um, but that's probably what it's most known for is it's, um, it's a gorgeous bridge with a, a telegraph and helm right there. Um, one of the things that's so cool about Chuck is that, that so many of the artifacts are still there. Um, you know, you can't take stuff. Um, so there's all this really, really amazing stuff to see. Uh, but if they ever started a program where you could pick one thing and bring it home, I would 100% pick one of these range finders on the Nippa Maru because they are just the coolest thing um, ever. There's one in the, um, in the museum there at the, uh, at the Blue Lagoon Resort. And man, that thing all, all polished up is really something to see. Um, but, uh, that's, that's one of the really special things about Shaq is that you can see that stuff and, and it's, you know, it's, it's there for everybody to enjoy. Um, yeah, if I, if I had to pick something, it would be one of those range finders for sure. Another, uh, new favorite of, of mine, um, one that I, I hadn't dived until, till the last time I was there is the, the Seiko Maru, um, 
funnily enough, this this wreck wasn't even on the the map at the the dive shop that we go to. I don't know how we kind of um, learned about it, um, but it's it's really remarkable. It's it's uh, funny um, that I even got to dive it. I had ditched my normal boat that morning that they dove it and. Um, opted to dive with some other people, but they liked it so much. They're like, oh, we'll go back. You got to see it. And um, it's, it's super intact. Uh, the, you know, the superstructure is, is remarkably intact and you can just go from floor to floor and see all these like personal effects. Like that's a, a coffee maker there. Um, the image in the middle, my, uh, my dad shot there, um, but just really intact. And I, I, I think that's one of the more, you know, remarkable things is is looking at all these kind of like day to day things and these personal things um, inside the wrecks. And so the ones with the really intact um, superstructures are are really awesome for that. Um, this one had a lot of close calls uh, at at C two and was was in for repairs. I actually came in with the the same convoy as the Amagi Sun, um, and they were undergoing repairs together. They both both had quite a lot of close calls and, and met their ends here um, in, in Chuk. And that one, that one is, uh, it's, they call it a, a deeper wreck, but it's, it's, you know, to the, to the decks about 140 feet. Um, and there's lots of, lots of really gorgeous soft coral. And, um, but yeah, man, it just how intact it is, is, it's really different than a lot of the other, other wrecks there. Um, you know, there's not as many, um, Kind of like like a lot of times um they'll you know they're they're very uh, like feature focused like oh you can see a bike here or a you know a car here this or that there and this you know this one doesn't have like a ton of standout things like that but just the the like integrity of the you know the ship that it was um is very evident and i, I just think that that's super cool um and certainly enjoy uh diving that and my last favorite, um, or not favorite, but the last one I'm I'm really looking forward um, to getting back to is the the Oidi. Um, this one I think is is super cool because it's one of the few bona fide military vessels. Um, you know, in in Chuk, uh, as I mentioned earlier, most of the the ships anchored there um, they they got out. You know, after the reconnaissance mission, so. There weren't a, a, a ton of, of bona fide military vessels hanging out. And the, the Oide is really a story about, a, about two unlucky ships. Um, they were escorting um, the uh, Agano out of truck and back to Japan. Um, it had sustained major damage and had been in for repairs and uh, was being escorted back to Japan when it was torpedoed. This was just a day or two before Operation Hailstone and uh, the Oidi rescued 520 something of their 700 crew out of, out of the water um, <clears throat> and headed back towards Chuk where it was ultimately um, sunk uh, just as it was entering back into the, into the harbor um, and lost every survivor of the Agano and all but about 20 of the Oidi's crew, um, <clears throat> which, you know, I mean, you, you can't help but but think about what a, a chaotic and desperate scenario that would have been with you know seven hundred plus people on this rather small. It's a it's a destroyer, a kamikaze class destroyer. So, you know that that and is is just kind of the most sobering um, wreck I think that it, that I've I've. <clears throat> been on there you know when you think about just how many people were in this small space and they knew what they were going into you know by the time they had headed back toward um toward truck with all the survivors on board you know they knew exactly what they were going into and from the the looks of the you know the the guns and the anti-aircraft guns they they certainly went down fighting um it blew blew the ship in half and sunk uh very very quickly the uh, the sterns upright and uh, the bows a little bit away upside down in the sand um, and and one of the things that that makes this wreck um, just so eerie and, and photogenic is that you know it it is a bit deeper so there's not a lot of soft coral um, so it's very 
it's very stark and it's on, you know, a white sand bottom um, rather than having a lot of sea life and stuff uh, around it. Um, so it's, it's very, very much uh, still like a, a war machine sitting on the bottom there. And it has not been, you know, like so many of the, the ships um, in Chuk are overgrown with just this beautiful array of, of life. Um, and this being void of that, I think is, is very fitting um, just because of the story of, of how it went down and what happened. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think it's easy to, to think of, of Trek as a playground for divers because it really is, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's the history is, it's exciting and, and seeing all these things is exciting. Um, but, you know, I think for me in particular, this wreck reminds me of, of you know, what we're looking at and, and why we're there. And regardless of whose side they were on, um, you know, to, to be one of those 700 folks on, on this ship, I, you know, I just can't imagine that. And, you know, you can't help but think about that when you're, when you're in that place. Um, <clears throat> That's just a, a quick rundown. I was trying to, to keep it to my 20 minute mark and I, I almost did that. Um, and now I'm super excited to talk about airplanes with <laughs> Brandy. <laughs> and thank you guys again for, uh, for having me. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. And we're just gonna, I just put into the chat, we're gonna hold questions till the end. Um, just to make sure that everybody has time, but um, beautiful, beautiful photograph. Somebody in the in the chat uh, the chat is typing clap, so we're all <laughs> clapping for you in the chat. Excellent photos. Um, so our our next presenter is Brandy Mueller. Brandy um, is a writer and photographer. Um, tonight she is going to be talking about the Guadalajara Island airplane graveyard. Um, Brandy's also a ship captain and captains uh, the Odyssey in Chuuk um, when that is in operation. Obviously, with COVID, things have slowed down a little bit over there. And I, we were just chatting before this, and one of the things I learned recently is that only 2% of the world's ship captains and mariners are women. Um, so I think it's a very cool thing to celebrate that uh, Brandy has achieved that and is captaining her own, is, is captaining a vessel and leading these dive expeditions there. So hats off to the female mariners out there. Um, and I wanna just show everybody Brandy's book. This is the Kwajalein Island, uh, Island Airplane Graveyard. It is a beautiful, beautiful book with many of the stunning photos that you're gonna to see tonight. It is in reprinting right now. So don't buy it now, wait until April, but mark it down and get your copy in April when it gets reprinted. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brandy. All right. Uh -huh. figure out the technology. There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. And thank you guys so much for having me. And Becca, you made me homesick for Truck Lagoon. And I can't wait until I finally get to go back. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about Kwajalein Atoll's airplane graveyard. So we're just going to move a little bit, a little bit east um, and also still the same time frame. Um, I know one of the first questions if you hit your um, arrow or space key, that should do it. I don't know what I just did, but I just did it. <laughs> All right, so uh, usually the first questions I get when I mention Kwajalein Atoll is where the heck is Kwajalein Atoll? And then also how do you spell Kwajalein? Um, as far as where it is, uh, kind of smack dab in the middle of the Pacific, uh, like I said before, just a little bit east of, of Chuuk. Um, it's about eight degrees north of the equator and right past the international date line, um, 2,400 miles from Honolulu. It's one of the world's largest coral atolls and one of the largest lagoons on Earth. Um, and thanks to World War II, there are a bunch of fun stuff to dive in that lagoon. Um, so for those of you who know about atolls or don't know, basically this is a really, really old island that used to be a big island that eroded back into the ocean. So the lagoon in Quaj has a max depth of maybe like 175 feet, um, but averages more in the like 100 to 130 foot range. So all of those wrecks that sank there are in um, nice nice dive range for, for us. Um, these islands are also um, currently 
uh, a bit of importance in that the U.S. Army leases several of these islands from the Republic of the Marshall Islands um, and do various uh, research projects. Um, one of the things that occasionally happens is there are testing of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So while I was living there occasionally, the cool thing to do would be to get some beers, go down to the beach and watch the incoming missile. <laughs> um, not something you usually get to do. Uh, this is actually a, a 30 second exposure. So normally it's just a little dot of light that comes through, but um, I ended up working on Quadulant for three years, which was quite amazing and got to, to see that and die of Quadj. Um, I've got one other map here I can kind of show you. Uh, so Kwajalein is here, quite close to Bikini Atoll for the other wreck divers out there. And then you've got Chuuk over here, Palau, Philippines. Um, so definitely in that, that same area happening there. Um, Operation Flintlock was a World War II battle that happened about two weeks before Hailstone over in Truck Lagoon. Um, and all of these islands, both which are now the Republic of the Marshall Islands and those over in the Federated States of Micronesia, have a really interesting sort of colonial background that they were first claimed by the Spanish and then um, bought by the Germans in 1899. So then after World War II, they were given to Japan as part of the uh, post-war post-war settlement called the Eastern Mandates. So Japan was supposed to look over these islands and take care of them. They were not supposed to build them into big military bases, which of course we know is what they did. Um, and then Operation Flintlock was the battle. It was January 31st to February 4th that um, the Allies, the Americans basically attacked Kwajalein uh, to take it back from the Japanese. And there were some sort of pre-battle pre strikes in December of 1943 that aimed to take out a lot of the Japanese airplanes that were up in the northern part of the atoll, um, up at Roy Namur. So when they came for the major battle, again, that was one of the, the main things they wanted to do was to take out the airplanes first. And the Americans' other tactic was to take the smaller islands in the atoll so that they could get into the lagoon and essentially attack the Japanese from, from the backside, which the Japanese didn't really expect. So using amphibious vehicles, they were able to sort of sneak in from behind for the two major islands and attack the Japanese from all sides. Um, one of the famous like quotes after the battle was that there was only one palm tree standing. Um, this is a public domain photo, but you can see it was just annihilated um, after after the battle. So there's still some really cool uh, Japanese buildings, particularly up on Roy Namur. Um, and I love the way they use this like intense rebar and concrete. And anyone who's lived in the tropics knows that it's hard to keep buildings standing for any amount of time. But for over 75 years and the time before the war that they were built, um, it's amazing that these structures still exist so close to the equator. Here's some other, some other buildings as well. The one up on the top was actually the, the commander's building and it has a really interesting sort of roof on it. It's a, a, cool, a cool building that I got to ride my bike past on the way to work most mornings. So very interesting place. Um, this was my office for three years. I know you're all terribly jealous, but um, basically I was very lucky to get a job as a boat captain, um, as a civilian contractor for the army. And my job was to take people back and forth from one island to another to go to work and then go home from work. So I just drove my ferry boat back and forth um, pretty much every day. Got to see lots of beautiful sunrises and sunsets. And then when we weren't working, we all went diving. There wasn't much else to do. So lots of um, Japanese wrecks similar to truck uh, are within the lagoon. Um, and what I actually want to talk about is about 150 American airplanes um, were dumped at the end of the war up close to Roy Namur. So in sort of a two square mile area, there's um, an estimate of 150 planes that were perfectly good airplanes still flying. They hadn't crashed. There wasn't anything wrong with them that they just dumped into the lagoon because that was sort of the mentality back then. We didn't really care what we did when we threw stuff in the ocean. Um, but throughout the Pacific, you'll see these dump sites. The, uh, the most famous one is probably over in Vanuatu at Million Dollar Point, which is where they just dumped a whole bunch of construction equipment into the ocean. And you can just 
do a shore dive and it's quite shallow and there's uh, cranes and bulldozers and trucks and all kinds of stuff. Um, and this was basically the same thing. The, uh, the war was over, we were done with them and they, the main priority was to get the troops back home and there was only so much room on the ships to go back home. So the idea was just to get, get all the personnel home and all these planes would have taken up extra space. Also, we wanted to stimulate the economy. We didn't want to bring a lot of cheap, you know, scrap metal to be sold for almost nothing back to the US. We wanted everyone to buy new stuff and stimulate the economy. So most of the stuff got left behind um, in, in the lagoon. So also some more pictures from Quaj. It also has beautiful coral reefs for when you get sick of airplanes, which I basically never got sick of the airplanes, but uh, beautiful reefs as well. Um, we also didn't have vehicles. We all just had bikes. So once you got off work, you would load up your bike trailer with your scuba gear and drive down to the marina and either rent a boat or just go shore diving right off the beach um, and get to see all of this amazing World War II history underwater. Uh, just one more map for you. So the you can see my mouse, right? The airplane graveyard is in this area. So Roy Namor is this island up here. The other main island is down here. This is Kwajalein Island. Um, so the airplanes are up in this section. And then there are several wrecks and other planes from war, both down at the south by Kwaj and up here by Roy. So there are seven different types of airplanes in the airplane graveyard. And like I said before, they're all in, in quite good condition. They were just loaded up on a barge and dumped into the ocean. So I'm just gonna talk quickly about each um, type of airplane that is in the graveyard. The, uh, the plane that there are the most of is the Douglas SBD Dauntless. And SBD stood for um, Scout Bomber Douglas, but it ended up with the nickname Slowly But Deadly. Um, at the time, the Japanese were flying the Zeros and we were flying these Dauntlesses and the Zeros could go up to 350 miles per hour and the SPDs could only go about 255 miles per hour. So significantly slower than what the Japanese were, were flying at the time. Um, but the pilots loved this plane. It was able to basically be hit and torn apart and destroyed and still got their pilots back home um, and landed even after they were shot up and torn apart and things like that. So they were quite a maneuverable airplane and um, basically the whole big workhorse of the, of the planes that were flying. So pilots were quite um, happy with these planes even though they called them slowly but deadly. Um, these are scattered all over this two square mile range, like someone took toy airplanes and threw them in the sand. Um, it's, it's fairly amazing. You can pretty much drop in anywhere in what we call the graveyard and you'll see random SPD planes scattered down in the sand. Um, a lot of them, they took the wings off probably so they could stuff as many as possible onto the barge. And most of the propellers were taken off and either stuffed in uh, the, the cockpits of the planes or we'll find them randomly in the sand, both the wings and the, the propellers just kind of shoved all over the place or just dumped in the sand as well. So um, there's certain sort of like GPS coordinates that we have that have like different names. And one of them is called 13 planes. And basically in one dive, you can see 13 of these, these SBD planes um, in one dive. One of the things with diving in Kwajalein is when you're working for the army is that you have to follow the army's rules. So unfortunately we weren't allowed to do decompression diving um, if you were working there. And also at Roy, they didn't have nitrox. So we were pretty much just diving um, air dives. So not a very long dive, but even in that sort of 20 minute, no deco profile, you could still see at least 13 planes in one dive, which was quite, quite exciting, um, I think. Uh, this is sort of one of my favorite views. I think this was the first, the first time I ever dove the airplane graveyard. This is what I first saw. And I was just like, this is amazing. There's two beautiful airplanes. Um, and this is part of that 13, 13 plane site as well. So from the beginning, the, the SVDs were kind of, um, they kind of had a bad rep because they were so slow. And while they were being used, they were also trying to develop a better plane, which would be the Helldiver uh, later on. 
And um, it still turned out that the SBDs were really good at destroying Japanese ships. They uh, were credited with sending 18 ships to the bottom, uh, six of which were aircraft carriers. So um, normally when the SBDs were flying, if they were on a scouting mission, they always had at least two sort of for, for mutual protection. And when they were flying as dive bomber squadrons, they used at least 18, usually it was 18 in, in the squadron at one time. Um, so these guys definitely did a fair amount um, in, in World War II. They also had the lowest loss rate of any U.S. Navy aircraft flown during World War II. So definitely a very cool plane. Even though after you dive the airplane graveyard a bunch, you're just like, oh, it's another SVD. Like, show me something else. I've already, I've already seen this plane. Um, I still think they're, they're really cool. Um, most of my photos are in black and white, but if you turn your strobes on, there's, there's some lovely growth on the airplanes as well. It seems like aluminum doesn't quite get the expansive growth that you get on, on the steel ships, even just a mile away from, from the airplane graveyard on some of the, the wrecks, you get much more growth than we seem to get on the planes. Um, but you do get some really pretty sponges, lots of fish life, um, lots of nudibranchs as well, I guess, Aluminum attracts nudibranchs. Unfortunately, I don't think I ever brought my macro lens on a dive on the airplane graveyard, but if I go back, I'm going to, because I feel like I need to prove that there are nudibranchs on the airplanes too. Um, but lots of marine life, we get turtles and sharks and things um, around the airplanes as well. The uh, second plane I want to talk about is the PBJ-1 Mitchell, and generally everyone is like, nope, that's B-25. Well, it's kind of a, a B-25 and it's kind of not. Uh, basically, the, uh, the B-25s were too big to fly off the carriers and the Navy didn't want them. So the Marines tended to get whatever the Navy and the Army didn't want. Um, so they ended up taking about 800 of these planes and then modifying them to better suit their purposes. So even though this plane wasn't great for carriers, it was really good for jungle and small island sort of landings where the fields weren't very good. Um, so the Marines took these, changed them, and then renamed them to Patrol Bomber Js. And the one stands for sort of the one remodel that they did of this plane. So there's actually 11 of these in the airplane graveyard, and um, they're so cool. They're just gigantic. Their wingspan is 67 feet. The length is uh, just under 53 feet. And it's, it's one of those feelings, like, like when you're on a big shipwreck, you just feel so small when you look around. And you're like, oh, there's this giant airplane that I'm swimming next to. Um, like with most things, I tend to get obsessed about, I want to see every single one of them. Uh, so one of my projects with a friend of mine was to, to seek out all 11 PBJs while, while I was up there. And um, there's sort of a, a list of GPS coordinates that the scuba club has, but then there's people's private lists of their you know, secret favorite spots and things. So we tried to get as many secret lists and compare all of the lists to try to find out where all 11 were, um, which was an interesting process. Like at this point, it's, it's a lot easier to get all 11, but while I was there, we, we didn't quite have a full, a full list. So we would occasionally go out with, with a random coordinate and not know if it was gonna be a good coordinate, if it was just gonna be a bunch of sand or another SVD. Um, and one of my favorite stories is that we were out one day looking for a, one of the, the PBJs that we hadn't found or hadn't seen, and um, we jumped in, and it was just sand everywhere, and there was four of us, but there was an SBD that was nose down with the wings on, which was very photogenic. I really wanted a photo of it, and as I got closer, there was another one, same thing, nose down, picture perfect. Um, so being, being who I am, I'm like, well, I'm going to go this way and look at these <laughs> instead of searching for what we think we're looking for. Um, so the four of us ended up splitting up me and Rachel, the other girl went off to look at the, the pretty planes and the boys continued our, our plan. And, um, Rachel and I ended up finding four of these nose down planes and then a PVJ. And we were like, oh my goodness, like was our coordinate so bad that we weren't even in the right direction or is our navigation terrible or what happened? We didn't know. 
So when we got back on the boat, we were kind of sheepish because like we figured that the boys didn't see anything. And it turned out that they found a PBJ as well. <laughs> so um, then we argued about whose navigation was good and who knew what they were doing and if we saw the same plane and somehow went in circles. And so we decided to stay and go and figure out what was actually going on. And it turned out that there were two different planes quite close to each other that we didn't, didn't have the coordinates um, that were good for either of them. So it was a fun day where we got to actually find stuff, um, even though I'm sure other people had dove on them before, but there wasn't, there wasn't a proper list of GPS coordinates yet. There is now. Um, so yeah, really gorgeous planes um, with even the 11 of them, they're all different. 10 of them are upright. Some of the engines are falling off, probably just from weight. Uh, they all have sort of different, different little bits about them. Um, I like this one because you've got the SVD close to it and it kind of just shows you, I mean, the SVDs are big planes and then this plane next to it just looks gigantic. Um, this is the one that's upside down. And that one, this one's interesting too. I think the bomb doors are open so you can have a look in that area. Um, this one also gets sort of from current some sand covers. So sometimes the wings are exposed, sometimes they're under sand. Um, I could just dive them again and again, and they're always <laughs> they're always amazing. And my friends would be like, can we please go and see something else besides airplanes? And I was like, no, let's go see the airplanes. Um, also sharks, turtles. Um, and it wasn't just the airplanes that they, they dumped in this area. There's also parts of Jeeps and trucks, um, lots and lots of bullets and, and different shells and ammunition are sort of scat scattered around the area. Um, there's a couple tanks also. So similar to the other dump sites around the Pacific, they just kind of pushed off all the stuff they were done with and didn't want anymore. Um, the next type of airplane I'm going to talk about is the Grumman TBF Avenger. This is my favorite airplane, although I think they're all secretly my favorite airplane, uh, but I really like this one. The Avenger was designed to replace the Douglas TBD Devastator, and it was introduced into service in 1942. It was the heaviest single engine aircraft that flew in World War II, which was kind of a concern, particularly when they were landing on the decks of the aircraft carriers because they were so heavy. Um, they also had a unique kind of newish technology called stowing, which is where the wings, um, they folded, they twisted and folded back onto the fuselage. And you can kind of see in this one how the wings are sort of a little bit twisted back. Uh, but a very pretty airplane. Um, this one was just under 41 feet long and a 54 foot wingspan. There's only two of these in the airplane graveyard. There's one that's upright and then there's one that's upside down. Um, and those are the only two that are there. Um, the next one is the Corsair, which is probably everybody else's favorite airplane. There's only one Corsair in the graveyard and it's, it's in, I just love this position where they're like nose down like that. Um, really gorgeous airplane. Lots of marine life on it as well. Uh, the lionfish in the Pacific obviously are not invasive. We like them, they're good, they're supposed to be there. And there always tended to be a couple of, of lionfish down by the, the propeller on the nose of the airplane. Um, this one is interesting too. It has, it has the propeller down on the nose and then there's also a propeller that's shoved into the, the, um, the cockpit of the, the airplane also. And the, uh, the Corsairs were known for, not necessarily known, but another characteristic of them is they have what's called the inverted gull wings. So you can kind of see in this photo, the wings have sort of a bend in the middle of them. Um, and that was important because this plane could go over um, 400 miles per hour, which was the fastest, uh, the fastest plane we had in, in, the, in the US at that time. Um, this was also one of the most successful fighter planes in World War II and probably the main plane from World War II that continued to be used years after. They, uh, they produced it until 1953 and it was continued to be used for a long time. Um, but back to the, the bent wings, because the propeller had to be so large to go that fast, um, they also wanted sturdy landing gear on the plane. So by 
putting that bend in the wings, the landing gear is actually at that lowest part of the wings. So you could have sort of short, stubby and strong landing gear, but that still let the nose be high enough off the, the ground so that the propeller uh, cleared the ground since it was such, such a large propeller. Um, one of the other types is the Grumman F4F Wildcat. This is another one where there's a GPS coordinate just called Wildcats and you jump in and it's, you just swim in one direction and it's like, there's a Wildcat, there's a Wildcat, there's another Wildcat, um, just like someone threw them there and they were just toys. The, uh, the Wildcat was um, basically the only effective fighter the Americans had until the Corsair's arrival in 1942. Um, and then the Hellcat also um, came into play in 1943. So at the time, um, this one could go 320 miles an hour. So it was almost as fast as the Zero, but still not quite as fast as, as the Japanese planes. Um, but it was, it's quite small and maneuverable. And they said that it was, it was very easy to um, take off and land on small escort carriers because of its size and its maneuverability. So um, also a rugged plane and the pilots said that it could survive remarkable punishment. Um, also pretty fish, lots of colors. There's, there's a time of year when sort of the glass fish bloom and the glass fish would just fill up like the whole cockpits of all of these planes. Like you wouldn't even be able to see inside of them because there would be all these, these little fish. But um, yeah, the wildcats were, were quite small, uh, less than 30 feet, they were 28, point, um, 28 feet, nine inches with a wingspan of 38 feet. You can see one here with um, some fish, some coral on it. Another, another view of some of the wildcats. There is one Curtis SB2C Helldiver in it the airplane graveyard. And this was the plane that they were creating to um, replace the, the Douglas Dauntless SVDs. So due to production and design problems, um, it didn't actually come into use until 1943. And it was significantly faster than the SVDs and more versatile. However, the pilot said that it was quite difficult to handle. It didn't maneuver very well. And it had a very long nose, which made it difficult to like see when they were taking off and landing on the aircraft carriers. So the pilots didn't, didn't like it all that much, um, but it still managed to rack up impressive uh, combat, uh, impressive combat record. Um, in 1944, it played a role in the Marianas and the Philippines, Taiwan, uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Um, in the nose of this plane, when I was living there, there was always a cleaning station with rats cleaning the fish. So this is an emperor angelfish getting cleaned in the nose of the airplane. I love, I love the connection between how the marine life has really taken over um, in, in Kwajalein and in Truck Lagoon as well, just taken over these sort of objects of war and then covered them in pretty coral and the fish live there and sort of this connection of, of life after, um, all these warships and things. Um, there's also a, a spare set of wings that we believe are Helldiver wings, uh, kind of close in the same area as where the, uh, the Helldiver is to some shot at that, that Helldiver. So the last type of airplane that's in the airplane graveyard is the Curtis C-46 Commando. And generally everyone knows more the C-47 than the C-46. And the C-46, there's only about 3,000 planes made versus the C-47 had over 10,000. Um, and both of these were based, they were developed based on the civilian airline uh, DC-3s. So um, really giant cargo plane, um, super cool to dive. There's only one of these in the graveyard as well. And at least one of the wings is kind of scattered in the sand, pretty close to, to this as well. Um, the C-46 sort of earned its fame uh, flying over from China, Burma, and India for the uh, British India, India route to bring um, cargo and passengers 
after Japan had already sort of seized control over all of the overland and water routes. So um, this plane could survive extreme weather, it could handle the, the altitude in the Himalayas, um, and it was very good on rough landing fields um, and carry a lot of cargo. So you can see why this plane would have been really good in the Pacific theater as well, because it was able to um, carry so much stuff and people over wide expanses of either mountains or in the Pacific theater case of ocean. Um, so, so yeah, that plane was used um, in that area as well. And there's just one of those, but very pretty inside as well. Lots of sponges growing and fish life inside the cargo plane. But wait, there's more. Uh, I kind of touched on this earlier, but it's not just airplanes. There are uh, Jeeps and trucks and lots of shells. There's one, one coordinate site that they call bullet pile, which is just bullets upon bullets all scattered in the sand. Um, so lots, lots to see in the airplane graveyard. And there's also lots to see throughout the whole lagoon. Um, this is actually a Japanese zero. It's in about 60 feet and um, very mangled Japanese zero just off Broy. So there's lots of other airplanes and wrecks to dive also. This was usually our like final open water diver dive. You got to dive a Japanese zero for your, <laughs> your fourth checkout dive if you're learning how to dive up on Roy. Um, the Prince Eugen is also in, in the Lagoon of Kwajalein. This is down on the, the south part of the atoll, but for those of you Bikini Atoll tech divers, uh, the Prince Eugen was part of Operation Crossroads, the uh, nuclear testing in Bikini. And um, it was a German ship and it managed to survive uh, both the, the Alpha and Bravo testing of Operation Crossroads. Um, it was very radiated, however, and they towed it back to Kwajalein to do more research on it with, with all the stuff they were, they were doing. And the story goes that it got a leak in it somehow and they were unable to get it patched or get personnel onto this very radiated ship um, to fix it. So they were in the process of towing it outside of the lagoon to dump it in the, the deep ocean water and Again, the story is that the tugboat did something and made a mistake and it hit the reef and it turned over um, and now it, it sank inside the lagoon and the stern actually sticks out at low tide. So um, it was a three propeller ship and at low tide you can usually see the two remaining propellers. The third propeller is actually in a museum in Germany, but phenomenal wreck to dive. Um, there's torpedoes, there's all kinds of stuff inside it. Again, if you're working on Kwajalein, you're not allowed to go inside of the wreck per army rules, um, but either in a time when you're not working for the army or so I've heard there's some really amazing stuff inside of it <laughs> as well. Um, phenomenal wreck to check out. And then there's other Japanese wrecks that are, that are gorgeous to dive as well. Um, unfortunately, these wrecks weren't protected as much as Chuck Lagoon in terms of salvaging, um, which we can mostly blame people who have lived on Kwajalein, not now because now it's not allowed anymore, but a lot of the previous residents of Kwajalein took a lot of the really cool stuff off these ships. So you don't get to see as many artifacts as you do in Chuck Lagoon, um, but still really amazing uh, ships to dive as well uh, in, in Kwajalein too. And, and other airplanes that aren't airplane graveyard planes. There's also some other Japanese planes. There's some Mavises. Um, this is a, a Martin PBM Mariner. It's a patrol bomber flying boat. And this is another one that it's, it's just so incredible to dive because it's, it's so big. You're just like, how? It's so weird to see planes underwater. And then when they're so big like that, to think that they were flying 75 years ago. Um, and then also, again, beautiful marine life. This is just off the beach in about three feet of water, baby black tip sharks just hung out, kind of like puppy dogs. Um, beautiful turtles, it's my friend Tim. <laughs> and dolphins and all the fun stuff. Lots of anemone fish. Um, this ship is called the Palawan. It was actually a Filipino fishing vessel that was requisitioned by the Japanese and used in the war. But if you live on Quads, you have to have your picture on the steering wheel or you didn't really live there. It's sort of a, a rite of passage to have your photo taken. 
by this wheel. Um, so yeah, I have a book that talks about this and some other stuff. It, it is being reprinted right now, so it should be back on Amazon around the end of April, or if you send me a message once I get some more, I'd be happy to send some out to people. But the publisher hooked me up with um, Alan Axelrod, who is a, a proper World War II historian, and he made sure that all of my historical stuff was right. And he, he wrote about half the book, um, really elaborating on each of these planes and what they did in World War II to um, help, help the Allies win uh, the Pacific Theater. So he did a really great job of, of bringing um, a very historical element to it. And then I talk a bit more about the diving and living in Quaj, and also sort of Kwajalein um, in the future as well. It is a, a low-lying atoll that is threatened by sea level rise and severe storms, also trash from thousands of miles away wash up on their shores. Um, so I touch on that as well. And I think that's all I've got for you guys. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me to do this and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions coming in because we have people asking questions on Facebook. And if anybody here, we're getting lots of claps again. And somebody uh, said they're sending a quad clap. So I guess that's an extra special clap. Um, so Becca, a uh, question for you. Um, and actually it's a question for both of you. Are there any protections on the wreck? I mean, I know there's significant protections in truck to keep people from taking artifacts from the wreck and things like that. So um, I guess we'll start with you. Can you talk a little bit about the protections in truck and then we'll turn it over to Brandy to talk about protections on the wreck, on, on the airplane wrecks. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, it, it's they, all the operations make it very clear um, when you get there that you cannot take stuff, um, you know, and they, there's signs in the airport and things like that about, you know, it, you can be searched on your way in and out. Um, and I think that, that other, you know, divers do a good job of keeping one another in check. I think when you're in a place where you, you, it's very evident that things have, have not been pillaged, um, it's, it's, you know, easy to keep everyone on board with that. Um, but, but it's definitely all, all the operations put that out there and, and you don't want to turn it into like a, an international incident um, and, and get caught trying to get something out of there. But I think it's really, yeah, each operation does a great job of, of letting folks know that, you, you, that that's just not cool. And what about in, Kowadjil, in the Kwajalein Atoll? Is it a little bit different because it's more remote? Um, no, not so much. It's the same. The same now. You can't. You can't take anything off the wrecks. And because you live and work on an island, the same thing. Like if you have something, someone is bound to tell someone, and then you you essentially lose your job in Kwajalein for for doing stuff like that. So um, the, no one takes stuff now. Unfortunately, in years prior, they have. Um, I always say in my briefings and in Chuck Lagoon that you don't want to take anything because the accommodations at Blue Lagoon Resort or the Odyssey are much nicer than shoot prison. <laughs> um, question for, for you, Becca. I, I've heard a lot of people say that um, Chuk is a really great place to go if you're a new diver. Um, and then there's also things for tech divers and people who dive really deep. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how varied the diving is there? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, you know, I think one of the, the cool things um, about that spot is there's truly something for, for everybody. And, you know, when we run trips out there, we will typically have, you know, a boat of, of single tank divers who don't want to do any deco diving and they're going to see all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and then we'll have a boat of, you know, like doubles folks who are like, kind of like, ah, oh, well, so we're somewhere in the middle. And then we've got a boat of crazy people who just want to like dive everything that's out in the pass and obscure that you have to hook into. <laughs> um, but there really is truly something for everybody. And I think one of my favorite things um, about going there is, um, is watching non wreck divers fall in love with it. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure Brandy would say the same thing, you know, people who are like, ah, I'm not going to go inside. I'll just check it out. I just want to see the coral. And then man, by like day three, they're like, I saw this telegraph and I, you know, this, and I love it. It's, it's really fun to watch that evolution. Um, 
is it something that it's, I, it's just, I, I've met one person who, who said there weren't enough fish um, and didn't care for it. But other than that, I, I think it's impossible not to fall in love with that place, whatever, you know, whatever kind of a diver you are. And it's a, it's an easy place to hone in skills too. Cause it's, I mean, it doesn't get any easier than diving there where there's, you know, no current, perfectly warm, clear water. Um, you know, people who will just, you know, cater to your every every possible need um it's a great place to dial in skills too so the million dollar question for brandy that people keep asking is how do people get to dive the Kwajalein islands and yeah, i know that from that some question. previous chats there's a lot of us who are wondering how do we get to dive the Kwajalein islands unfortunately it's very difficult um it is a secure military base when you even land in Quaj, like if you're on the island hopper, they tell you that you can't take photos out the window and you can't get off the plane. Um, so yeah, unless you work there or you know someone who will sponsor you, it's it's very difficult. That being said, um, master liveaboards pre-COVID and hopefully after COVID are doing trips to Bikini Atoll that either start in Quaj or end in Quaj. So in that case, you can get off the plane, you get escorted by the military to the docks and you get on the ferry boat that I used to drive. Uh, and they take you over to Evi where you get on, on the master. And usually master's been doing a couple of dives. Usually they dive the Oigan. And then sometimes they also offer if anybody wants to do um, a dive or two on the airplane graveyard. It was funny, I did that trip and they posed that question and nobody else in the boat wanted to do the airplanes to which my heart was broken. And I was like, really? But I figured I shouldn't argue since I was only one um, and I've been there before. But yeah, so your best bet right now is actually to, to go do Bikini Atoll and get a little bit of quad on the way, um, the way there. So um, a question about uh, a photography question, I guess we'll, we'll ask both of you. Um, what kind of camera would be the best camera for an amateur? Somebody was asking in the chat, like the best camera for somebody just learning how to shoot and dive. <laughs> that that depends um, so much on, on so many factors. Um, main, main one being budget, really the best camera for somebody starting out is, is the one that you can, you can get, <laughs> um, you know, that's ultimately, you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, you know, if, if, if money weren't an object, I would sell everyone a Nikon D850, uh, cause you can take terrible photos and then get good stuff out of them later. Um, <laughs> and, and there's something to be said for that, especially for starting out. Um, but, you know, and I know uh, Brandy, too, would, would say that, you know, the same thing. It's it's really what you've yeah. got to shoot. How much money you want to spend? Also, I shoot with a DA-52. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That answers it. And that's the only real answer. <laughs> Does anybody have other questions um, before I ask one final question? All right, it doesn't look like they do. So I'm gonna ask you this. So when we started kind of concocting this plan to do World War II in the Pacific, we were like, we're gonna do something and we're gonna have a two female wreck diver photographers and we're gonna talk about women and wreck diving. And then we were like, no, we just wanna talk about wrecks and not being women. But uh, my, I guess my question to you is, what is it about shipwrecks and plane wrecks that you have found so fascinating um, and what is it that kind of draws you to this, this work? Because there aren't that many, um, we found out in the process of thinking about this presentation, there aren't that many women out there doing this. What do you think it is that's kind of driving you to do this work? What is it that fascinates you so much about these racks? Should I go first? I'm unmuted right now. Um, See, that's an interesting question. Like I, I actually, in, in the beginning, I didn't think that I liked Rex and I ended up going on the Odyssey um, years ago, just because, you know, it's, it's an amazing, everyone says to go there. It's an amazing place. And I, I completely fell in love. And like, I love diving something that also has this story where you can either before research it, or you go on a dive and then afterwards you're like, oh my goodness. And this, this plane or this ship also did this in this thing that basically made life how it is today. Like I love, I love the stories and like researching the, the stuff we find like in Truck Lagoon, like what is this? And oh my goodness, like we had that back then and how did they develop this? And um, 
I just love having that added story along with doing a dive. Um, it's quite cool. I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, you know, I, th I think that's that's the, my same reason. I I, I love um, things that were uh, and are no longer. And so, I think underwater, it's that's doubly cool. Um, but I, I will also, you know, break into abandoned buildings and stuff on land for the same reasons. Um, just you know, watching watching nature take things back. Um, you know, and taking these 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 very human elements. Um, and, and watching them turn into something else and and truck being a, a really cool example of these you know like machines of war that are are now reefs like thriving reefs one of the trips we went on we brought um a bunch of coral researchers from arizona state university with us and and it's one of the most diverse places for for coral um and stuff and they found a correlation between and it's interesting you mentioned that brandy um steel and and coral growth and things like that on shipwreck so i mean it's just so fascinating these these things that were were used maybe for for killing or day-to-day -day or technology or whatever but just watching them become something else is is just really really neat Awesome. Well, I want to thank you both so much for being with us. This has been an amazing evening and such beautiful photographs. Um, we'd love to have you all back again. Um, obviously, Becca, you're stuck with us because you do this all the time. But now that we have Brandy, we want to have her back too. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. For those of you who asked or came in a little bit later, this we are on Facebook Live. So it's immediately after the presentation, it will be available for people who want to watch it again or if you want to share it with friends. And we'll also put it up on our YouTube channel for anybody who wants to take a look at it. And please, um, if you haven't already, take a look at our website, our new website, www.dbtenacious.com, or you can get there by atlanticrec.com. Um, next week, we're going to be wrapping up our Tenacious Live series with um, Mark, Mark Corbett. Mark is going to be talking about shipwrecks from the Outer Banks. He's a phenomenal photographer. Um, and has been uh, documenting all of the wrecks in the Outer Banks. So that's really gonna be a treat and we're excited to have him with us. So that's next week, seven o'clock. And then after that, we're gonna be back in the water. So we won't see you on Thursday nights, but hopefully we'll see you on Facebook because we'll be posting all of our new adventures and our dives and, and the, the big plans that we have for this season. So thank you all so much again for being with us and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>